Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending ACAM's webinar, COVID Pandemic Comprehensive Update, presented by Dr. Avi Herskowitz and Dr. Suzanne Turner. Before we introduce everyone, I wanted to briefly mention an upcoming event for ACAM. We will be hosting a live virtual advanced circulation training on February 12, 2022. Our first speaker today is Dr. Avi Herskowitz. Dr. Herskowitz is the president of ACAN and his academic background in cardiology, immunology, autoimmunity, and virology. His most recent academic position was as a clinical professor of medicine at UC San Francisco. Dr. Turner is the founder of Vine Medical Associates, double board certified in family medicine and anti-aging and regenerative medicine. Her thriving practice threats rare and unusual diseases in patients from around the world. Practicing functional medicine, Dr. Turner has special interest and experience in bioidentical hormone therapy, metabolic medicine, neurodegenerative disease, and human performance optimization. Among her many accomplishments, Dr. Turner served our troops as a physician in the US Navy for several years. Prior to her tour of duty, she did an internship in general surgery, then completed a residency at Emory University. Dr. Turner is an award-winning teacher of medical students and physicians on the faculty of Emory University, A4M, IPS, and ACAM. Uh, I'm privileged to join everyone today with Dr. Turner, one of the most energetic and brilliant doctors that I like to work with and I like to co-host with. And so we're really fortunate on that. Um, I also want to give out a, a shout out to my special friend in New York, as well as uh, all the ACAM members and, and all the AAPMD members. Thank you, Howie, for uh, participating tonight, too. I want to talk, again, the last time we gathered together was around February, basically nine or 10 months ago on the subject, and we sort of went into a holding pattern. We did present a lot of treatment data, epidemiological data in the past, but I wanted to give an update before the new year and also make some uh, predictions going forward uh, for us to understand where we really all stand with the COVID pandemic. Uh, and I'll, I'll start with looking back, as we all can remember, the tragical upswing in, in infections coming to New York City and New York State and the Northeast in March of uh, about 20, 20, 21 months ago. And I wrote down a set of hypotheses and published some of them in ACAM's website and talked about what I thought may be the case, uh, certainly by April, 20 months ago, that natural immunity may end up to be the, the best long-term protection. Uh, so exposure and then um, recovery may end up to provide the best long-term protection. And then since we understood how the ACE2 receptor worked, we could develop rational approaches to reduce consequences. And, and these are not antiviral consequences. These are consequences when you manipulate a receptor in the body that's responsible for multiple hormonal communication and, and immunological and metabolic functions. So since we knew the, the, the mechanisms, we could adapt to it. And we immediately understood that the elderly and patients with uh, multiple other conditions, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, were by far the most susceptible. And it was clear from the very beginning from the impact on the um, nursing home populations across the Northeast that this was the case. Now, we also got a flavor that severe complications were not likely to be due to the virus directly, but due to an abnormal immune response. And that was consistent with the ACE2 receptor being dysfunctional. We also knew that in any viral infection, any, any viral epidemic or pandemic, asymptomatic infections would certainly go unnoticed. And therefore, relatively speaking, the hospitalization and death rates would be somewhat exaggerated and that's been, uh, that's been held true, I believe. And I'll explain further a little bit later in the talk. But that uh, the most controversial was that lockdowns would, could be and would be a, a useful short-term tool, but not a rational tool for a highly transmissible virus. And there's not been uh, circumstances where that's ever been proven, nor has it been really shown definitively here. So the goal would be 
to protect the most vulnerable rather than trying to stop the virus. And varying countries around the world have had different strategies. Uh, and even today, we don't know what strategy is best. <clears throat> By identifying and protecting those that are vulnerable, then we have really what, what the main part of the population really wants to know, and that is, what is my personal likelihood of being hospitalized and, and dying? What I wanna know about myself and how, if I know about my, what my personal risk is, then I'll be able to address how I can best protect myself. Now, of course, that's the most obvious question for prevention, but it's also the main question that was raised uh, with the risk benefit for vaccination and now for boosters. But, Let's address the, these little things going forward. And I think you'll understand what my points will try to be made throughout the, throughout the talk. So if those are the questions, then the case fatality rate doesn't answer this question. So the, we've always been told something, I think the, the current data is that 1.9% fatality rate globally. Um, but that number is relatively meaningless for each one of us personally, because that's a population number and it includes the highest risk groups with the lowest risk groups. And even the number of infections doesn't answer the question. Not only don't we know what the number of infections are, the test that we use for infections, namely the PCR test, is not an accurate reflection of, of active infection as I think most of you already know. But now there's 50 million confirmed COVID cases in the United States, but the estimates from the government are that they're more than three times that. And even that doesn't answer the question, well, what about me and oh, what about my, my youngest son who goes to university and when he asks the question, well, what is my risk? Uh, striving to reduce these rates indiscriminately. And that's what we're barraged with every single day, all day and all night. The number of cases are rising, the number of cases are rising. Well, I don't know how, how useful that information is because if you're striving to reduce and suppress that number, uh, you'll have a lot of unsustainable collateral damage or unsustainable costs. And that isn't never been shown to actually be uh, an effective strategy. So now with a faster spreading, but much milder, ultimately pathogenic virus on the Omicron, the variant, that's even more the case today. So right now, as we stand, the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of hospitalized patients and patients that are getting ill are getting ill from the Delta variant in the US. This of course peaked in the, in the springtime in the United Kingdom, as well as other places around the world. Um, but right now, this is the absolute dominant factor here. There's one death, I believe, that was documented in the United Kingdom and perhaps a death in the U.S. Um, more, most recently, but it's, it's not a, an active player at this time. So in small uh, font here, um, I could have gone into many, many different ways of expressing this data, but the, the reality is, is that the, the data suggests, coming from the CDC, suggests that vaccinations uh, improve the, the, the risk of hospitalizations in the United States. By the most important one is the factor of six in the, in, the, in the aged population, the greater than 65 population, and even more so for the others, although the other populations, particularly from 12 to 49, are much lower, but the, the, the difference between unvaccinated and vaccinated uh, people are, are, are much more pronounced, understanding that there are a lot more people who have been vaccinated than unvaccinated. And perhaps the last few days, even more so, um, the data seems to be more mixed than this. And it seems to be more patients who have been vaccinated are being hospitalized. And we don't really have any characterization yet of who they are except to say that when, when you've had primary infections in the past, you've always had 94% of people have had comorbid conditions. So I, I believe that that number will still hold true. 
So if you look at the adult population greater than 18, you'll notice there's something like a tenfold difference or so between vaccinated hospitalizations and not. But if you look at the at, at the legend on the left and the rate, it, it's at, at its trough, it's around 10 per 100,000. And at its peak, it's around 50 to 60 of the population. And that's for the adults, so to speak, the greater than 18. Of course, the majority of the folks in here at the top are of the 80% of the elderly. But then you look at the 12 to 17 year olds and you say, oh, it looks like the same type of curve, except when you look at the legend on the, on the left, it really goes from one to four rather than 10 to 60. So it's off by a factor of maybe one to two log, log differences. So this is what it looked like in 1918. There were three waves of infection. The middle wave in 1918 was the most devastating. And so what does our virus look like as compared to the influenza pandemic in 18? Uh, well, I think you can see that it looks somewhat similar to this as a slide of different COVID-19 deaths normalized by populations for a variety of different countries trying to find an overall pattern. So when you look at the blue in the United States, you could argue that there are around three different uh, humps there and different patterns, except, except to say that when you look at the United Kingdom, there's only two, two humps, and then, and then you look at Germany and so on. You, there are different patterns for every country. And I think that that's clear as day to me now after following this uh, epidemi the epidemiology of the virus for the last 20 months. But if you also look at the bottom, and really, if you remember, Sweden was the one country that did not do a very strict lockdown. They had their two humps back in May of 2020, and then uh, six, six or so, uh, nine months later in, in February and March of this past year, and then have been relatively flat since. So I'm gonna make the argument that those of, those of you that think that you can predict how this virus will act necessarily, what the patterning really is, is due to is probably a fool's errand. So right now we had 50, officially at 50 million cases. Many of these cases are duplicate cases. The number of deaths of course are, 800, are over 800,000 and roughly 7,000 patients uh, uh, every given day are hospitalized uh, per week. But the overall fatality rate is 1.6%. Globally, it's 1.9%. But the estimated true fatality rate is around one half of 1%. But that is also an estimate of the fact that there may be up to 150 million active immunized people uh, due, to, due to natural infections. So the, it's, a, it's a range of threefold and maybe up to fivefold. We just don't know at this time. So, when I look at the, at the graph more carefully, I think we're entering the sixth wave here and in the United States. And you can look at other countries have more than three waves and so on. So this is becoming to be a bit of a unique virus, particularly because the Delta variant, which is now the number sixth wave, is, um, is still quite active uh, throughout the world. And again, Omicron is, is just not a player at this time when it comes to hospitalizations and, and deaths at this particular moment in time. So this is becoming a bit more a different form of the same patterning, which is a virus ultimately extinguishes itself, but still perhaps with Omicron, it will see its final days um, uh, as a truly in, a pathogenic virus. So. We've done this many times before. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but it's really perhaps still one of the most important concepts for us. And that is on the right side, the last three graphs of the, the, the number of the, the ages that where all the, the most of the deaths reside, you'll notice that they started 65, 75, and then greater than 85. Now, there are more 65-year-olds and there are more than 75-year-olds and more than 85-year-olds. 
uh, but the number of deaths keep on rising despite lower population. So they comprise 80%, again, still today, 80% of all hospitalizations and deaths. And when you compare them to less than 30 year olds, there's a 65 fold difference. And then when you compare them to the real youngsters and the ones that, that are more important are the ones that are cu currently being vaccinated and, and soon to be boosted, the five to 11 year olds and then the 12 to 17 year olds respectively, they're really a fraction of 1% of all the, the deaths. So we're talking about when you hear the case fatality rate being 1.2%, well, obviously it's truly dependent upon what age group you're in and what risk group you are. And that's something that I don't hear anyone talking about in the government when they talk about the statistics is all they talk about are numbers of cases and numbers of deaths without trying to allow you to individualize. So and then there's a, the poor five and 11 year olds that are out there. The sum total of the, the data from the last 20 some odd months is that 94 children uh, died uh, with COVID or, or by, from COVID, it's unclear, but it's really less than 2% of all the deaths amongst these children. And then the FDA, of course, approved vaccinations for, for these kids. And we're trying to vaccinate a group that is already at very, very low risk, although we will more likely than not save some COVID deaths and perhaps um, switch them over for other complications, we, we, we pray that we don't. But when you look at the overall cause of death in this age group, because it's such an extreme deviation from my rational way of thinking that when you have, in this case, it was, there were 66 deaths in, in this particular CDC database. Well, there were 800, there was almost a thousand accidents and, and so on. So it really is low on the totem pole in terms of causes, and we're trying to um, expand the method in which we're going to curtail this virus. But I, by the end of this talk, I think it'll become clear that that is not the only way to proceed. Now, why is it that those uh, of you and, and myself included look for patterns? We, we don't, it's very difficult to find it. And, and that's, for a number of reasons, some of them are listed here. And first of all, there are regional variations of COVID-19. There are even regional variations in terms of the Delta variant, the Omicron or the Alpha variant. And there, on top of that, so that means the virus is a bit different here than in Japan, than in Ireland, than in Sweden, even though it's in the same period of time. The, there's a lot of immunogenetics that most of us are not familiar with. And, this was my work early on in my academic career and the immunogenetics of autoimmunity, but it, it's really post-viral autoimmunity that is the most common. And, and those of us, you can have 10 people exposed to the same exact variant of COVID and the exa exact same amount of dose, and you'll get 10 different, uh, different patterns of response, some of which are not sick early and then get ill or later from autoimmunity and some get really ill early and get over it and so on. There's a, any variety of different immunogenetic um, variances. And then the vaccine brands and dosing regimes in the, in, throughout the world are, are remarkably different. When you get the AstraZeneca in the United Kingdom, when it first came out, you had to wait 10 to 12 weeks between dosing. Then they ran out of the AstraZeneca or they had to hold it for complications of clotting and brain um, clotting. And, and then you, you were given the Pfizer vaccine and a mixture and so on and so forth. It goes on and on. So there's a lot of variability there. There's heterogeneity in the ACE2 receptor amongst all of us. And then one of the most important things here when you're looking at information from different countries is to say, listen, how many people in this country have been naturally infected and are naturally immune because that should probably give you the much more lasting immunity than any particular vaccine. 
And then I put this thing because we all know that inflammatory state is, is also driven for most of us by the state of our gut and uh, regional variations in the food supply. Uh, the more automated the food supply, the, the more processed the food supply, well, then you're gonna run into more COVID related inflammatory problems. So when you look at the global statistics, this isn't every country, of course, there, and I, and I forgot to put in Brazil, just to show one really, one important thing, two important things. One is South Korea, okay? When you look at South Korea and the absolutely low number of deaths per million, that is the, um, the best case scenario in, in, in Asia where we can trust the data, uh, Japan is next. Taiwan is, is exceptionally low as well. But for a reasonably large country, it's exceptionally low. And I, I proposed early on that this had to have a genetic component, uh, but we just don't know. There, there, there's little information on, on that uh, globally. And then the other one is the difference between Sweden and Israel. And, and Sweden obviously didn't lock down, but the majority of these deaths occurred early and ha has been relatively flat and lower than Israel uh, for the last six months. So again, whether or not you lock down, whether or not you have all your, all your people vaccinated, doesn't seem to really fit a clear model. So if, you, if someone can notice a, a pattern here, please tell me what it is, because I, I can't find it. Um, this is over the last six months from these countries I showed you earlier, and I frankly cannot see a pattern. Uh, so every country is a little different. Every country has different ways of treating patients, different ways of prevention. For example, Germany has very high a level of integrative care, but um, in fact is, is no different than the other countries. So again, uh, let's look at these numbers a little bit more closely. So when you look at the age, the age has to then be looked through a lens of comorbid conditions, right? And we can see from the top left that, you know, the top three or four are high, high blood pressure, obesity, metabolic syndrome, which is more in the pre-diabetic, diabetic, diabetic uh, range and the lipid range, and then cardiovascular disease. Um, and, and that is the bulk of it, the, the majority. And we knew early on, really early on, and it's been fairly similar the whole time, and that is that the majority of people who actually had the worst case scenarios had multiple of these, um, uh, of these comorbid conditions and at least one in 94%. Interestingly enough, and always interesting to me, is the immune suppression only, only was less than 10%. And that means that if you're immunosuppressed relative to a viral, a viral illness, it does not, it's not the same as, as being immunosuppressed to a bacterial infection. So what did we do? We tested for COVID and we came up with a, with a test that would uh, be very sensitive, but very nonspecific. That means that in the cycle counts that we use between 35 and 40, we're not diagnosing anyone with a transmissible infection unless they're symptomatic. And if you have 100, 101 fever and you have a bad cough and you're taking the test, more likely than not, you're, and you're positive, more likely than not, you're infectious, but you don't need the test to tell you that. But when you're asymptomatic, the test is extremely nonspecific for whether you're putting anyone at risk around you. But that's the test that we have. It's meant to overdiagnose the more important types of cases. Um, and this is the slide that we've all sh shown each other over the last two years. This is back about a year and a half ago already, where, uh, where, on, the where on the graph on the bottom, it shows you at the, at, the rate, at the cycle rate that we're usually using in the West, which is between 35 and 40, you're capturing only a very small proportion of the cases that are actually infectious. So the majority of people with a PCR test in the real world that are coming to get tested, although that's not a sample of the whole population, then, then your, your, your test is positive. It doesn't mean that much more. So then you say, well, am I immune? Am I, you know, this is the question that we all get asked, I think, every day. Should I get 
a booster? Should I, you know, I've been infected. Why do I need a, why do I need a vaccine? Uh, but maybe, uh, maybe now with Omicron, I'm going to get sick and maybe I'm not immune. So tell me what to do. So they say, okay, well, the first thing is you, you take a, you take an IgG, IgM test, you take an antibody test. And be, because we all know from very basic immunology that neutralizing antibodies that are generated fairly early and they're established protection against the virus. And the more, more important uh, statement below is they're extremely easy to test. So th this type of a test came up immediately um, and, um, and is very easy to do. But when you look at, so this is what we, this, the, the ELISA tests are, are, are what we use. Well, what is the real story behind this? Well, antibodies are just a small part of a larger and poorly understood set of both antibody and T cell mediated immune responses. So that's the reality of any viral infection. And this infection is no different. So in addition to antibody functions and T cell or lymphocyte functions, or cellular immune functions, we have the entire complement cascade that's never discussed. And then the so-called macrophage family of these phagocytes, which are uh, monocytes, which are responsible to deliver the, the first message to excite T cells and B cells to produce immune reactions and antibodies in the first place. It's a cascade, it's an orchestra effect and of which antibodies are only part of the thing. So then, okay, but okay, I have, I have antibodies or I don't have antibodies. What does it really mean? I've been infected or I received the vaccine. Well, what is, what, tell me what it means. So there are many different assays that would and be able to unravel what, if you're immune or not, the trouble is they're just complicated to do. This is a quote from uh, the NIH. Well, they are complicated to do. There's one T cell assay that's being used in research studies, but is not commercially available. So this is a busy slide, but I just want you to focus on the left side because it's not just one, it's not, not just antibodies to one thing because COVID-19 is a little bit more complicated than the other coronaviruses, that, albeit it's clear that it's more deadly. Well, the reason it's more complicated is because there's multiple immune reactions to multiple sections of the spike protein and other forms of the, pro of the, of the protein. So there's multiple layers and multiple immune reactions going on at the same time. Um, so it's not as simple as the, the prior coronaviruses. So you can have a patient on the left side who has severe COVID-19 that has very rapid development of IgG antibodies. The trouble is those antibodies are not orchestrated right because the, the whole ACE2 receptor is not functioning properly. So there's, nowhere, there's no way to turn it off. So they have a high antibody spike and then they get sicker than they would have if they didn't have such high antibodies. And I'll explain in a minute why that's the case. And then you have another one who's got mild disease and neutralizing antibodies sort of come up rather slowly. And that's because they have more T cell activation or more other, the other part of the immune system is activated more rapidly. And they don't need that many antibodies to contain the virus. And so there's a complicated thing going on. It's not just a simple, let me take the antibody test and I'll know everything I really need to know. And that's because it's easy. Now, examining the research in the last bullet, doing the research studies properly and saying, well, what's really going on? The people that ultimately get sicker later with long COVID requires a more detailed analysis. And right now that analysis is just poorly understood. We just don't know. So when there really is, I, I hate to say, there's essentially no correlation between immune function and protection at this particular point that's really very, very clear across the population. So 
you know, what you really want to have is neutralizing antibodies. Uh, and when you don't need them anymore, that's okay. Then you have your T cells come in and, um, and give you memory or sort of the, the memorizing the, the epitopes that they have to fight for future infections. But there's no clear one pattern that will keep you immunized like you would normally be for multiple years after being exposed to a virus. So if my IgM and IgG antibodies aren't present, does that really mean that I'm no longer immune? And do I need a booster or do I need, and what do I need to do? Tell me what to do, please. Well, the fact is, is that the T cells save us, quote unquote, or give us long-term immunity from uh, any viral infection. And that's, this is a, the slide take too long to explain in detail, but basically these CTLs, these cytotoxic T lymphocytes, uh, bind to these infected, uh, virally infected cells through this thing called the MHC complex, the major histocompatibility complex, and that produces a dead, a dead infected, a, de a dead infected, COVID infected cell, and this is actually what gets turned on more rapidly after you've had natural immunity. Or, or, or after, supposedly, the, the best case scenario is after you get vaccinated. So when you look at people, the average person that's, you know, the majority of people have been infected in the United States remain asymptomatic. So what happens then? So when you measure their bloods, almost all the patients amount to T cell reaction, but only 60% showed antibodies. So this highlights that in, when you're really healthier, quote unquote, have, have a really healthy response, 40% of people don't, uh, don't, even have, don't even have measurable antibodies and are still asymptomatic. And then when you have T cells around, you don't need as many neutralizing antibodies. And that's why you find the antibodies are dropping after vaccines, a vaccine um, deployment. Well, they're supposed to rise and they're supposed to fall because the secondary wave is dictated by the T cell population. So don't be frightened. I just put this in for myself uh, to remind me uh, to tell you that there are probably a thousand PhD um, immunology people around the country studying this in interaction between the virus and the development of the memory to the virus and then what is this paradigm doing in people who remain ill, in particular the long COVID type of patients. But if you have this intact, you're gonna get the virus, you're either gonna be asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. So unraveling this type of stuff is, is doable, particularly with T cell testing. There are assays to do that, it's just complicated to do. And this is also from the NIH. Well, it is complicated and you can't scale this to a national level and you can't explain, you know, cellular immunity to uh, the public in, in a very easy way, but it, it should still be an aspiration. So this is more complicated than other viruses um, that we've had in, in the same family. And that's because the, the, there's more immuno, there's more stuff that immunizes the, that activates the immune system to a variety of different proteins. And then you get a lot of different T cell reactions and a lot of different B cell reactions or antibody reactions. And that's here, well, I think I'll show you in a minute um, what, what's, what's happened to different patterns of antibodies. But when you look at the red, the, the fourth bullet there, it says, this was part of the hypotheses that you have severe complications were likely due uh, not to the virus itself, but to some abnormal immune reaction. And some of those reactions are, you know, take place in the first month and obviously the first week in the hospital when you're really sick and then ultimately in the first month and some of them occur later and now become the long haul COVID population. But that pure antivirals, uh, unless they were given early, would not work, and that's been that's been substantiated over many different studies. That if you gave an antiviral or you gave a, a monoclonal antibody later, or you gave convalescent plasma too late, you wouldn't um, 
you wouldn't really do do as much as you you could. And then my area of interest on the research side has been the development of autoimmunity. And this virus is clearly one of the most autoimmune triggering viruses that we've ever come across. And all of you know the different the different rare uh, forms uh, of these uh, autoimmune forms. I'm most familiar with the myocarditis form, which is a well-known autoimmune state and may develop more in, in healthier folks and healthier people than in, in, in the iller population and younger people. So again, it's a genetically modulated type of thing. If you have the immunogenetics to respond in this way, there's not much you could do other than understand that it's happening and uh, take, take a rest and go on uh, non-steroidal and you go on a leave basically. Don't seek uh, any specific stressor on your heart. But, but the interesting thing is when the pre people with pre-existing autoimmune disease got the virus, they, they, they have no evidence of worsening. So then we had this New England Journal paper come out uh, recently in the last few months that said, listen, uh, we have this thing called long haul COVID and we, act, we don't know what to do with this. We just don't know. So how big is this particular problem? And many of you practitioners out there see these, are beginning to see these patients. Um, they typically are now going to see a variety of long haul COVID clinics in the academic community, in the large hospitals. Almost every large university hospital has uh, a growing uh, long COVID um, uh, clinic with multiple subspecialties uh, forming together. And this is a big deal. This is somewhere between 10 and 30%. It's probably 15 to 20 million cases as a conservative estimate. And the average patient is, is young and um, this, will, this will be a major problem. So there are two types of people in this category. One is the person who's uh, sick in the ICU for 10 days and is deconditioned and has some pulmonary scarring and is exhausted and has low thyroid and low adrenal and, and just is, needs to be reconditioned. And that's gonna take a long time, let alone the folks that have been intubated from even longer periods. But, but and then there are folks that are um, a month or two out, even longer out, and then develop a sort of a chronic fatigue-like syndrome or like something like a Lyme syndrome that is not due to Lyme and not classic chronic fatigue, but is a post-viral state that I call autoimmune, but we haven't, we haven't truly characterized it yet. So they say, they quote, long COVID is not blood clots, myocarditis, multi-system disease, um, pneumonia, or any well of the characterized condition, but it's a range of system, symptoms that can last for weeks or months, or now we already have patients that have had long COVID for up to 18 months uh, to anyone who's had COVID-19. And they bring up the relationships of, uh, we all, many of us in ACAM know, look like chronic fatigue syndrome or myoencephalitis. Uh, that's what they talk about. And they start saying that let's work together to find common ground. Uh, although they do tell all the patients that I've seen with long COVID, that have gone to the major academic centers have said, have been told that they don't have therapy for them to take. So then you say, well, what about this stuff about autoimmunity? And uh, I know that, that a lot of the destruction that takes place is not virally mediated. So what about antibodies and how, ma how many of them are productive and how many of them are not productive? So when you're hospitalized with COVID, about 50% of the hospitalized patients are making nonspecific antibodies to a lot of things that are triggered by the viral antibodies. So this is called polyclonal antibodies. And some of these people develop autoimmune disease rapidly in the first month. And some people do it long, a longer time. And, and some of these long COVID patients, perhaps the majority of them will have some combination of this. And then some of the, long, some of the iller people also have bad cellular communication, they have low nutrients, poor hormonal states, 
they don't have a good, their detoxification system are overwhelmed and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All, all, all of the uh, integrative practitioners and patients out there know that all these things are true, even when we're in good shape, let alone when we have a bad viral infection. So when you study them carefully, within one week, 20 to 50% across a variety of different studies of patients develop new antibodies to their own tissues. And these are called autoantibodies that were not there when they were admitted. And many of them, like the anti-nuclear antibody, the rheumatoid factor, the antiphospholipid antibodies against your coagulation system, these antibodies levels are similar to as if you were diagnosed with an autoimmune condition. So this is not trivial, just you know, very low le level stuff. This, this could really make you sick. And then this is uh, saying that this, this is the um, uh, sort of a title that says roughly one in five hospitalized patients. I don't know what the number is. I'm not seeing a long line of patients outside the door, but I do take a lot of calls from colleagues all over the country. And this is a serious, this is a serious issue. And you'd think that this would offer a renaissance for studying post-viral states and then get people to understand that it doesn't matter whether it's COVID or it's a Coxsackie virus or an enterovirus, a GI virus in the future, we're at a state in society where we are more and more of us are prone to this type of dysregulated immune system and we might as well take notice of it. I, I don't think we've reached that level of awareness, unfortunately, because the, by our standards, public health is simply uh, at this point in the United States is simply vaccine logistics and um, mask wearing recommendations. There's very little else on the public health side going on. So, and you say, well, I think all of you, all of us are getting a lot of information on, uh, from patients, a lot of questions about vaccines and uh, should I get the vaccines? And so I think most of us in the big cities have vaccination rates north of 80%. And, and it's a great deal of controversy in regions of the country and so on. So, and generally speaking, you know, the adverse events are generally underreported. We all know this. And we, we really need to look at it from an individual perspective. The predictors of risk are just simply not, not known. But I would look at you know, if someone's going to ask me whether they should get a booster or not, I'll say, well, what happened to you when you got your vaccine? Uh, and whether or not you have any of these inflammatory markers, some of which are listed there, I want to understand how your body is currently handling inflammation and natural killer cell counts, which is a, a, a marker for your in, innate, so to speak, your, your surveillance immune system. And um, and you have to look at these things and, and develop an experience and then get feedback from the patients. And then everyone's got to make their own decisions. Uh, obviously, some populations um, like us healthcare workers don't have that option. So I, I wanted to, to finish with just a few things and um, in terms of therapy, because I wanted to ask um, Dr. Turner to focus on, on therapy. I've fo focused on a lot of different treatments in the past, and we've go we have gone a long way. And yet, it's interesting and fascinating to uh, to ask the question as to why we don't have a protocol, a, a known protocol for for prevention, a known protocol for treatment throughout the country. And that I find to be a, a serious weakness in our particular public health sector. But uh, you know, going forward, as we enter the the winter time and more people will get the flu. I, I see a, a marked rise in, in flu-like illness, which is not, not related to COVID and with you know minor colds as well. Well, don't forget about the biome, vitamin D, of course, which interact with the ACE2 receptor and infl inflammatory cascades. And, and we as a society are overweight with metabolic syndrome. It's almost 90% have some form of metabolic syndrome and prediabetes, et cetera. It's, it's an enormous number that we have to uh, try to get out, get out more and realize that locking ourselves down and waiting to get ill is not a rational approach to a virus that is becoming 
even more so infectious, but not necessarily dangerous. And let's not forget that once one of my favorite slides back in the old days in 2020, it showed the people in, in, in Spain that got injected with vitamin D as soon as they got into the hospital, 98% of them never needed to go to the ICU and no, none of them died, whereas uh, the other group, 42 were, were in the ICU and 8% died. So this is pretty impressive for a simple thing. So I'm not gonna dwell on this. You can give an hour talk on vitamin D and it isn't the answer to everything, but it's something that everyone should be measuring at least. I see patients referred from major university hospitals with long COVID and they simply don't have vitamin D levels measured. They say, what's the future gonna look like? Okay, so you ask the question, well, if COVID-19 has multiple epitopes on the protein side that, that immune cells respond to, then why is our vaccine only dealing with the spike protein? And maybe you just don't get an adequate T cell reaction and, and only a short-term B cell or antibody reaction because of that. So all of our current um, vaccines that we have approved in the United States only target the spike protein. And we have multiple other, other candidates going forward that are doing multiple proteins as their targets. And we're all waiting for this Novavax vaccine, which looks like it has a, an established older technology, as well as dealing with multiple antigens, uh, as well as the, 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 the SARS spike protein as well as a vaccine target. So this may be uh, something that can be more useful and less toxic uh, per se, or less dangerous for long-term issues. Uh, and then in the near future, I think it's clear that since Omicron is highly transmissible, but producing relatively mild disease, at least so far, clearly um, across the world, it should boost population resistance. And that's a great thing as, as it was in the third wave of the 1918 pandemic. And we hope this will disturb the Delta, current Delta wave um, uh, hospitalization and death rates and lead to overall suppression. But suppressing the numbers of people that get positive PCR tests um, shouldn't be our societal goal. It just, um, uh, it just has too much collateral damage. Because right now, when you look at excess deaths in the United States in 2020, the majority of them uh, were related to the virus. At the same time, a growing number of them were related uh, to excess deaths in, in the heart attack and stroke group and dementia group. And that was not insignificant uh, and is growing, growing, growing in 2021. So the proportion of people who are collaterally damaged by not having access to doctors and to the healthcare system are growing. And then it's gonna, it's gonna evolve into a non-life-threatening virus, which it, I believe it already is for the, again, for the majority of the population, but obviously it's not for everyone. And it's extremely sad that people are still dying from the Delta variant. And then we have more things in our toolbox. We have the newly approved Pfizer oral antiviral that reduces hospitalizations and severe illness. We have the established monoclonal antibodies, which tend to work quite beautifully as long as they're given early. Um, and the uh, convalescent vaccine, as long as it's uh, the convalescent plasma, as long as it's given early. I'm not going to get into uh, hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin for that matter. Uh, and I, I think that overall, uh, these, the patterning of the virus as well as these new treatments are gonna, no matter what, lower mortality rates further. So I wanna end now and I could open it up for some questions as I think we, we finished a little early and we could take some questions and then I hope to take questions also with um, after Dr. Turner's call separately and together, okay? Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Herskowitz. So we do have a couple questions here. And the first one is from Michael Kokesh. And they say, <laughs> Hi, in, in the vast universe of viruses and in the galaxy of coronaviruses, how unique is SARS-CoV-2? Well, it's a, it's a most extremely clever, clever virus and uh, it's chosen um, a, a fairly unique mechanism of 
of, of activity against the population that uh, tends to be o overburdened by uh, physiological life stressors. And the stressors are not emotional stressors. I mean, stressors that are going on in the body. So that unique ability to, to, turn, to turn the ACE2 receptor into a weapon uh, against folks that are already inflammatory and then continuously and produce a, a chronic inflammatory state, right? That, that's just not, not able to be turned off. Then the, that's a simple explanation. But those of us that take care of folks with chronic fatigue and cr chronic Lyme and mold and so on, these other conditions which tend to evade the immune system, tend to be able to be persistent, uh, tend to be able to produce uh, activation that isn't regulated and, and is sort of going off in, in what I call a chaotic state. Uh, this is uniquely positioned to do that. And the other thing it is doing is we're in this sixth wave, if you count the, the waves carefully, and this has been, this has lasted um, this is up and down, up and down, up and down. That's because I believe in the United States, we have so many different patterns emerging state by state. Right now we have, I think six states that occupy 50% of all the hospitalizations. That reminds me of what happened when this first started in the East Coast. We had six states dominating the mortalities that took place for the first three months of the pandemic. So I think that there's a lot of biochemistry involved, but this like, it, like, it produces a persistence. And while I, I have to say, I may have seen one or two people that are, I consider to be healthy by, in, by real laboratory testing, not just by the fact that they seem to be in good shape, quote unquote, get ill, get, get moderately ill. I'd say the overwhelming majority that I've ever seen have had a lot of different issues that needed to be optimized uh, before they, and, and they didn't, they just, they went into the illness a bit naive and then came out understanding how much work that was needed to be done to get themselves uh, stronger and operationally efficient, you know. Thank you, Michael. And our next question is from Jason Wright. And he says, I'm wondering why COVID stayed very transmissible during summer months in higher temperature areas, unlike other viruses. Well, uh, I, don't, I don't even know if that's, necessarily the main driver i think you could you could argue that it is and um i think it's i think this this particular virus i don't think there's a there's a there's a virus out there that's produced more sort of unusual patterning than this virus so um either the virus is weird or we're weird and i think the answer is both of them are so this is the most modern virus that's a that's, attack, that's attacking the entire global community. And certain communities are simply, like in Africa uh, and India, where it's awfully, awfully hot in the summer and their pattern of the post-viral state is, is much, much different than ours, but then you have different genetics. So I'm not, not sure if you could pattern it. But the reason that people are not getting as sick in Florida now is because you, know, you live in Minnesota and they live in Florida, I just don't know. Based on news reports, several countries in Africa with very low vaccination rate also have very low case infection rates, yeah. etc. In your estimation, what could account for this variation as compared to developed economies? Well, I think there's a few things for those of us that have worked in the developing world. And one of the things that comes up that doesn't isn't discussed at all really is they they are a function of survival of the fittest. So if you make it in Africa by the age of two, then you're healthier than an average two-year-old in the United States or in, in the developed world. So you have certain things going on there. They also are not as clean as we are. So they're much more subject to autoimmune, to, to less, they're, they're much less subject to autoimmune states than we are because we are so sanitized. Uh, so we have, their immune systems are more activated typically but activated in a productive way. So uh, I think that their food supply is probably cleaner. Um, and then there's some genetic, there may be some genetic component that's not shared by the African-American population uh, that's more predisposed. 
So I, I, I don't think we know. And the funny part of it is I don't think anyone is, I'm not aware of anyone doing these type of basic, you know, studies that need to be done. Um, I, don't, I don't think that they're being done. There, I know that the NIH has delivered, I think $3 billion to study long COVID. Uh, I just recommend that they talk to some of the ACAM doctors and that'll be a good idea for them to do that because we're not baffled by long haul COVID. We're not so confused um, as you would be if you only came at it from a single perspective. This is from Diana Fong. She says, how would you manage the side effects from the booster? Well, um, I tell it when, when if you're going to get your booster, then um, pre preventively, I, I'd say that, you know, mit, skip the McDonald's meal beforehand and um, get your vitamin D up. Uh, I don't hesitate to give a lot of vitamin D before. I have people take uh, some glutathione before or any one of the antioxidants, you know, could be simple vitamin C, could be resveratrol, could be alpha-lipoic acid, whatever you, you, you want to do, but uh, take a take some extra antioxidants. And I am not a fundamentalist, so I, I, I believe that you can't, you are allowed to take and leave once in a while. And I think that I, I like to use it even preventively, so pro prophylactically, but I'm not, um, I can be criticized for that, I know, but so what? But that's, that's what I do. And then I take the vitamin, I ask the folks who take the vitamin D for a few days afterwards, maybe three to five days. And, and uh, maybe it'll help. I mean, I think that it's possible that with enough of the boosters, that's why I gave the lecture the way I did is to make the point of saying, why am I getting my booster? I'm getting my booster because my antibodies may not be as high as they need to be, even though that's the wrong test to use. So if you're in the younger population, then what are you trying to accomplish? I have no idea what the accomplishment is unless you're forced to do it uh, like I am. So, so, but at the same time, I don't think that um, it, it, it's rational for, for everyone to just go ahead and, and get a booster at this particular moment in time as if Omicron is the threat. Omicron is not a threat. Omicron may end up to, to, to be the, the single fastest way that we'll get to, um, to a state of you know, population immunity uh, because we'll, more, and more of us will get infected. Because I think, again, I think, I believe that right now it's a, as more people with Omicron have been vaccinated than not. So. Dr. Herskowitz, will you comment on the T-detect test? Yeah, well, uh, again, I have, I don't have, I ordered the, the T, that test and haven't received it yet. So I, that was about two months ago. So it, it's going to be a good test. I do send my lab to, to Europe because there is a lab that can test for specific T cell and specific B cells to a variety of different, uh, different proteins on the spike protein. And invariably, um, the, the B cell activation disappears and, and, and the T cell activation appears. So I think if we had that test and we made it as available as the rapid antigen test, uh, whether I have you know, the, the rapid you know, PCR, whatever, the rapid antigen test and made it available, then you'd know. And it would be a simple, it would be a simpler decision, even though it's still gonna not be 100%. But yeah, I think that that's a great idea, but I haven't been able to get a hold of it. Have you? Yes, we have. I've had about Good. probably 15 patients do it. Good. And I would say about half of them are positive. Yes. I mean, this is a, you know, if you're looking for patterns for everybody, then I think, it, again, you're going to be looking for a long time. But if you, if you have T-cell immunity, then you have much less of, a, of, a, of an argument to take a booster unless you have to. And I, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with, um, with getting into mandates for boosters. And then I'm uh, really uncomfortable with getting uh, annual or tw twice a year boosters, again, as a rule, because uh, we we don't we're already an autoimmune population, so we don't need any more activation with with things that are sort of on uh, relatively unnatural. Thank you, um, Dr. Turner, and and um, I grew up calling it Occam when I first. So I don't know. Sorry, it's that you call it ACAM. Yeah, ACAM. That's why I call it. 
<laughs> no one's ever no one's ever criticized me for that so it's i call it acam yes akam that's a good name too my uh my nurse practitioner is from the ukraine and she calls it akam so thank you for having me i really appreciate you guys inviting me to speak today my hope is that we'll be able to go through this and you'll be able to see the things that maybe can help us. One of the problems that I've, I feel so passionate about is from the very beginning, I have felt like we needed to take care of our patients. And I had uh, nurses and medical assistants in my office who were so afraid of contracting the virus that they forgot that we all signed up to do this, that that was what we decided, that we, what we decided to do in becoming uh, providers of this kind of care. And so it's uh, exciting to me to be able to present this to you today because I feel like this is something that we can all be taking care of patients in the right way. And so I hope that this will give you at least a sketch of an idea or another idea because I know there's lots of folks out there that have their own plans and formulas for how to treat patients. This, of course, is my disclaimer. This this contains opinions and ideas which I have formed based on my experience treating patients. It is intended to provide helpful general information on the subjects that it addresses. It is not in any way a substitute for the advice of a physician or physicians or other medical professionals based on your own individual conditions, symptoms, or concerns. If you, the listener needs personal medical health, dietary exercise, or other assistance or advice, the listener should consult a competent physician and or other qualified healthcare professional. Both I and those appearing on this channel specifically disclaim all responsibility for injury, damage, or loss that the listener may incur as a direct or indirect consequence of following any directions or suggestions given in this video and using any products or services described in this video or participating in any programs described in the video. So just like Dr. Herskowitz was talking about, we have this period of time um, with at the very beginning where this sort of treatment periods of time. And so we mark everything in days of symptoms, uh, days since exposure, and then days since symptom onset. And our treatment needs to be guided specifically based on those determinations as best we can. Uh, because there are different things going on in the body at different periods. This past spring was, of course, the time when the vaccines came out and being a young, healthy uh, person who exercises regularly and sleeps right and eats well, I, I decided that I was going to allow as many other people as possible to get the vaccine as they were at the time not very available. And so even though I was continuing to treat COVID patients in my office, I had been exposed several times and felt like a superhero. So I had not contracted the virus and decided not to take the vaccine for lots of different reasons and uh, contracted the virus back in uh, May. So my experience was that of everyone. It, I had a pretty severe fever and some muscle aches and pains. I actually thought that all I had was um, rhabdomyolysis, frankly, because I um, had worked out really hard at the gym on Thursday and Friday, and my fever only lasted about three hours. So I thought I'd contracted rhabdo and was not worried about it. But then on day three, I was completely asymptomatic. And on day four, I had another one hour fever that went away completely. And I was fine on day five. So thankfully, my experience was mild relative to others. But it gives you the example of where we have to be making some obvious, um, a, be, being aware of some changes, because patients will come back to you and say, hey, I'm feeling better. And then that's the time when we need to make sure that we're intervening on that cytokine storm because we're no longer treating viral infection. We're now treating the resultant auto amplification of, of, of um, their in, immune response. And as clinicians through ACAM, we know how to treat that. That's what we do on a regular basis. So this is kind of exciting. And a lot of what I'm going to tell you are things that you probably already know, um, but hopefully with some new tweaks in your help there. Um, so this is what we do for prevention, obvious things, maintenance of a healthy body weight. I loved when the um, original, the previous Surgeon General came on television and, and he was expected to talk about COVID and whatever he was going to say. And the first thing out of his mouth was smoking kills more people than COVID. <laughs> 
<laughs> I love that. And so um, anyway, all of these are ways that we know of, especially working with ACHEM, ways to help take care of patients, making sure your vitamin D is at least 60. I know lots of you have a higher range even than that. And this is on your, your annual physical exams, your regular visits with patients. We should be doing that because the research is showing that as patients approach the virus with an already elevated vitamin D, outcomes will be better than patients who approach the virus with a uh, lower level to begin with. An albumin greater than 4.5 and alkaline phosphatase less than 60, both of which are super beneficial in preventing the onset. I mentioned GLP-1 here because of the fact that GLP-1s have the most evidence, and I'll go into that a little bit going forward, of benefit if we're talking about treating our diabetic patients who we know are at higher risk for this illness. We want to make sure what kind of medication we are treating them with to begin with. Um, as a big peptide fan and user, this is one of my favorite categories of medications. If you haven't read the article by Rawlins, R-O-W-L-A-N-D-S from 2019, um, it's very clear that these medications have amazing benefits in so many other um, areas. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Zinc, of course, stress management. We know that anxiety is the number four biggest risk for patients to have poor outcomes with COVID. And so if they are stressed about their COVID, they're more likely to have a bad outcome. Moderate alcohol intake, hormone balance, and um, vaccine administration, which I do think at, in some patients is part of the treatment um, strategy. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Growth hormone, of course, this is all in the prevention category, and I'm a big fan of using growth hormone secretagogues, but let's talk about growth hormone itself. Um, because of how it works to improve T-cell in proliferation as we age, our thymus gland becomes replaced with fat, and we know that growth hormone will, will stimulate that thymic fat fraction to reduce. Um, this is found in that Fahey study from a couple of years ago, where they were talking about aging and specifically um, inflammaging where the thymus gland uh, atrophies as we um, age. And using growth hormone or growth hormone secretagogues on a um, consistent basis can improve that thymic fat fraction so that we have more of our thymus gland available to produce T cells. Um, it also stimulates um, B cell production, um, it stimulates oxygen radical reduction specifically by monocytes. So those M1 aggravated, I call them the um, henny penny um, cells of the innate immune system can be reduced so that they are now not more like the janitor or, or, or causing some calm in our cells. And that's one of the things, one of the reasons why we use things like growth hormone. Uh, and so that's the reason why we would consider using this in a pre or a preparatory manner as for patients. There are several examples here on the left and right of different kinds of growth hormone secretagogues, the growth hormone releasing hormones, and the uh, ghrelin agonists or growth hormone peptides. And these both in combination have a better chance of improving your growth hormone uh, than, than either one alone. So I often will use these in combination with one another in low dose on a daily basis or a five days a week basis. And we know that as far as hormone replacement therapy goes, that cells from women receiving hormone replacement therapy secrete more growth hormone releasing hormone than cells from women not on hormone replacement therapy. So I think that's very interesting how this interplay goes on. And we know that, um, that the immune system is significantly improved by this growth hormone, as we just mentioned. So if all we do is balance their hormones, then we are helping them with their um, growth hormone production and helping them with their immune function. And then uh, this is that study I was talking about, the Fahey study from before. In this particular study, they used growth hormone, specifically growth hormone, but they also used metformin and DHEA. The purpose of this study was an anti-aging uh, trying to reduce the epigenetic changes. However, the metformin they used to decrease the uh, high blood sugar effects of growth hormone and they, the DHEA they used to decrease the high cortisol effects of growth hormone. And so it was sort of throwing on two other things to, have, to make sure that we could use growth hormone. I think that we solved that problem by using growth hormone secretagogues instead. Um, and as far as I understand, Fahey is now in the process of doing a study with growth hormone secretagogues and uh, GLP-1s, um, which I think will be a great option. 
um, because of the GLP-1s having such great um, anti-aging benefits. But the point of this study is the re reversing that immune senescence that occurs because of thymic involution. And again, this is a preparatory how to plan ahead of time. And I just put some basic general dosing guidelines. Um, I usually dose this with berberine because it um, berberine blocks DPP-4, which is the enzyme that breaks down sermorelin and other growth hormone uh, secretagogues. Um, again, GLP-1, uh, these are abundantly expressed all over the body, especially in the places where we expect that COVID patients will be affected and our COVID long haulers will be affected. Think of this as the way that we get our cells to choose to use oxygen to burn cells. So, if, so these cells, when they're under stress, particularly in the long COVID, um, during the infection itself, and then also in the long COVID, these all of our cells are under such stress because they don't, they're, they're using the Warburg, Warburg effect. They're using um, no oxygen to uh, make energy. And so the cells are under stress. They create more reactive oxygen species. It's this persistent problem. And one of the things that the GLP ones do is really help to reverse that. So especially in your diabetics, but, and, and your obese patients, this would be my number one uh, treatment strategy, pre, pre infection exposure, pre exposure. Um, and then regardless of the effects on glycemic control, it is anti-inflammatory. Uh, this is a TNF alpha and IL-1 beta. If you're familiar with IL-1 beta from the inflammasome production that occurs with a lot of this. Um, as far as viruses, it inhibits this IL-1 beta. Again, it interferes with nuclear factor kappa beta. A lot of us who use uh, low-dose naltrexone understand about how that goes. That nuclear factor kappa beta is sort of the tattletale in the cytoplasm in the, and the uh, liquid around the nucleus of the cell that goes into the cell and tells the cell to begin to um, fight an, a war. So now you begin to create these inflammatory chemicals and the bomb inside the cell uh, the inflammasome. And we know that GLP-1s can inter in interfere with this process and promote survival. Um, this study was done in rats and it's um, particularly after lipopolysaccharides, so bacterial in induced systemic inflammation. And then this was a specifically in humans test that was done with using GLP-1 in uh, COVID infections. And these patients who were on a GLP-1 as they encountered the COVID infection, they had a, um, a decreased total mortality, emergency room visits and hospitalizations. Um, these are dosing guidelines for, the, um, for using it. Please start really low dose if you're starting these out. There, please be cautious about a personal history of medullary thyroid cancer. These are FDA approved to treat um, obesity and diabetes. I use them in my personal patients to treat impaired fasting glucose, to um, treat preventively um, neurodegenerative diseases and uh, in my uh, COVID long hauler patients. And then um, do, if you're going to give them a growth hormone secretagogue, be sure take to use it away from the growth hormone secretagogue. GLP-1s enhance somatostatin production. Somatostatin is a break on the production of growth hormone. And so even though it breaks growth hormone, you want to um, separate it time-wise 12 hours or so from the um, dosing with your um, growth hormone secretagogues, if you're going to use them. Thymus and alpha for vaccine augmentation. And this is one of the ways it's most men. You can see there's several studies using this, um, using Zodaxin is the brand name for it, or thymus and alpha one to as a co-treatment for, for vaccination. These were mostly done with influenza and also primarily done with elderly patients, uh, most of these studies to enhance the vaccine response. So someone asked a question earlier about what do you do? And in my patients, I will give them uh, this in order to uh, give them pre and post vaccine, a dose of this to um, enhance their response to the vaccine as well as to diminish their illness response to the vaccine. Um, so far, I've had really good success with doing that um, with my N of about 20. Um, this is the mechanism of action. It has direct antiviral actions. It upregulates natural killer cell production, which we know is antiviral. Um, it also is immune modulatory. So it doesn't necessarily, depending on what the tissue is, where you are going, in some tissues, it will raise the cytokine storm. In some tissues, it will lower, depending on what the cell needs at the time. So if there is a virus infecting the cell, it will upregulate that. It helps to produce those MHCs on the outside of the cell that are sort of the flag saying, hey, this cell is infected, so that the immune system can then see that cell and attack the cell. 
Uh, it also will help to, so, so depending on what the cell needs, it will do what the cell needs. So you, when you give this, you have, this is one of the ones you don't have to be super careful about the timing of administration because it's effective at all phases, both in the antiviral and in the immune modulatory needs for the cell. So early outpatient treatment, um, we include several of these uh, therapies. I'm only going to talk about the ones that are less familiar, but we use, you know, biologics and vitamin C and vitamin D and butyrate. We use that antiseptic nose and mouthwash and recommend that quite a bit, um, either with, uh, with peroxide or with betadine. Usually the betadine is just easy to do uh, that when it's available over the counter in a branded product already. So we don't even use, we just don't worry about it. Um, melatonin, aspirin, we do hold their testosterone while they're being treated for this um, or any sort of testosterone boosting therapy we hold during that time. Uh, monoclonal antibodies, of course, ivermectin, nidazoxone, and azithromycin. And we don't use that azithromycin for the um, antibiotic properties, although that, that has been beneficial in a few cases. We use that primarily for the lung inflammation benefits. Um, if you go and look up azithromycin and asthma, there's tons of studies showing its benefit in um, lung-related illness. So this is not a peptide, but it's a small molecule that I use quite a bit and love for all kinds of reasons. It is a glycosaminoglycan that is heparin-like. It's about 1 14th the, the um, heparin or the anticoagulant ability of uh, heparin, which is great. It is polyanionic, meaning lots of, if you all who, who treat a mold and Lyme know about that from doing using binders that are polyanionic. Um, it is FDA approved for oral use for interstitial cystitis. It has efficacy against single-stranded positive sense enveloped RNA viruses, including this. This study was amazing. This Russian river virus uh, showing these patients do very, very poorly. Uh, unfortunately, they have a uh, really bad outcome as far as their arthritis goes. And the um, improvement uh, in the arthritis in these patients, the return to function is really amazing. Uh, it has evidence in SARS-CoV-2 because of its ability to that polyanionic binding to the virus before it enters the cell. And then in HIV and HTLV-1, it has, uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't put that, that um, reference up there, but it's, I can send it to you afterward. It decreases, by, I mentioned before, viral binding by the polyanionic charge. It increases the anti-inflammatory IL-10. It decreases MMP3 and 9. These are metallomatrix protein, proteinases are used to degrade tissues to allow for viral entry. Um, and then it decreases IL-6, which we know is particularly pertinent for this particular virus. It does not specifically alter the kinetics of viral replication. So it just blocks the entry of the virus and then it treats the inflammatory destruction process um, on both ends. So it doesn't specifically, it's not involved in viral replication. So you still need to use something to treat that. We know that this uh, rage, this um, because of our diabetic patients having these advanced glycemic compounds, th they bind to this rage receptor, and it is specifically involved in the cytokine storm. SARS-CoV-2 increases production of this S100A12 ligand that binds to that rage receptor. That rage receptor then turns on this huge inflammatory storm, and that's what happens. We know that. Um, uh, pentosan polysulfate decreases that rage. It also affects nuclear factor kappa beta. It increases CERT1, which we know we need for repair of DNA, NERF2, which improves the production of antioxidants, and then estrogen receptor alpha, which also in, is involved in improving inflammation in general. This was specifically done in control of oxidative stress and inflammation in a diabetic patient, um, sorry, in diabetic mice, but because it controls, this is the reasons why I choose to use this in my patients. This is a phase two clinical trial using this at this dose twice a week. Side effects um, are diarrhea, nausea, hair loss, injection site reactions, bruising, and possible vision changes. So be cautious when you use this in patients who are already on anticoagulants. I have personally used it in patients who are on anticoagulants. I just watch, their, um, watch them more closely and very clearly describe to them what their risks might be. So things like brushing teeth, bowel movements, et cetera, seeing blood in those situations, they need to be, they need to alert me immediately. Um, and I recently treated a COVID patient who um, has a history of macular edema due to his diabetes. And so we chose not to use this pentasan in that patient because of that risk. 
Uh, again, this is in the treatment phase using thymosin alpha-1 because of how it decreases the reactive state of microglia. We mentioned that before about the henny penny versus the janitor state of the microglia. Those can create this inflammatory storm that just continues to, per this auto, auto amplification that continues to go on why these patients get particularly sick. It also decreases um, tumor necrosis factor alpha, IL-1 beta, and IL-6. And then all of these others increases T cell, natural killer cell maturation, um, improves anti-inflammatory cytokines, improves neutrophil attacking response, promotes that Th1, Th2 shift, improves antioxidant production. So it improves your thymocyte ability to uh, not respond to steroids. So if you're giving your COVID patients steroids, this can improve the, the um, when you give them steroids, they, their thymus gland can, can be suppressed and it improves the thymus gland apoptosis that occurs from steroid use. Um, and here's the references for that. Um, this is in a COVID patient. Treatment significantly reduced the mortality of severe patients um, in patients with, uh, particularly in patients with lower uh, CD4 counts, uh, less than 600. Um, they gained more benefits from TA1. So the ones with the lower CD8 or CD4 T cell count gained better benefit. It um, reversed their T cell exhaustion as I mentioned before, and they were able to um, improve their uh, thymus output during their infection because they had this TA1 on board. And there's three references. It significantly reduced hospital stay and viral shedding, and then it can uh, markedly decrease a 28-day mortality and attenuate lung injury in these critical. So here's two more um, studies on that. Thymus and beta-4, this is another that we use in some of our patients. Um, and I use this um, at a unique point in time. Um, I usually will use this at the very beginning in fighting the virus from the beginning. Once they get into the, to the cytokine storm phase, I'm not using the thymus and beta-4 so much because it, there's one study out there that shows it increases PAI-1 which might contribute to their, to their clotting. So I don't use it beyond day four in patients with COVID. Um, I certainly use it in my uh, patients who have COVID long hauler for their rep repair and recovery, but it does upregulate VEGF. Um, it is a G-actrin sequestrant. This is, think of this like the train tracks that help to get things from nutrients and cells from one place to another. And so if you're, um, if this is able to hold these G-actin pieces in one place, sort of like a toy box, then we're able to get things laid down quickly rather than having to gather them from all over, create them, and then, and then produce a, the tracks to be able to send things back and forth. Um, it does improve oxidative stress and improve mitochondrial dysfunction, which is, we know, one of the things that happens um, in these cells, particularly ones that are exposed to advanced glycation end products. Um, it suppresses production of inflammatory cytokines, it decreases oxidative stress, um, and it's particularly helpful for um, migration of stem cells. The dosing, um, and I use a dose kind of, uh, I use a dose just like this in the office if they're within that one to four day period. For my long hauler patients, this is what, these are the things that I particularly use. Definitely correct their dysbiosis. This is, as, as um, Dr. Herskowitz mentioned, this is a dysbiosis problem. This is a, um, we, I would call it a SIRS problem. I always look for SIRS in these patients. I've started doing that um, genie test on these folks. And um, it's amazing what you're finding, what I'm finding. Some of them actually do um, have some similar similarities to this. And particularly the hypometabolism that's associated with conditions like ME-CFS and um, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, uh, very similar conditions. Um, we use LDNM Lexinox for its anti-inflammatory benefits, um, melatonin, of course. The GLP-1s, as I mentioned before, VIP and DIHEXA. And this uh, is a, uh, there, there, is, there are some recent studies using this, um, treating actual patients who are actively ill, and the 19 of them survived to, 20, to day 28, compared with four of the 24 individuals in the um, standard of care group. So there's a nine-fold advantage in probability of survival and recovery from respiratory failure using vasoactive intestinal peptide. Again, this is a protein naturally produced by your brain. The one that was used in this study is actually a synthetic version that's getting ready to be available through a pharmaceutical company. But we use the one that is available as a nasal spray through our um, local compounders. 
there's several that I like, um, but it has some really great evidence of benefit. And, in, and we, and I use this in my long haulers. Now the, the downside of long haulers is you have to use super small doses. And so you'll see in my, do I have a dosing slide? Yeah. So um, in the dosing, um, you have to be careful because they will have, um, you can't use that. I think that that 100 should be 500. It's a super wide range of dosing. And you know, a lot of those patients who have SIRS, ME, CFS, this COVID long hauler, they don't tolerate a lot of medications very well. So you can get this made in a super low dose and give it to them one spray per day. Please make sure you're giving it in the morning. VIP resets your circadian clock so that you will increase production of NAD. So you'll have quite a bit of NAD in the morning. And that's why you want to give it then. If you give it too close to bed, you'll, you'll induce insomnia in these patients. And you know they already have a problem with insomnia to begin with. Um, diarrhea and dizziness are probably the only other side effects that I hear of and not super common. That Those are actually um, really decent doses. The standard dose that we use, though, is um, 500 micrograms. And you guys know what we typically do is wait until after we've treated them for a while before we give them the higher doses. And that's all I've got today. Thank you very much. Well, as I, as I said, um, Dr. Turner is going to give us a mouthful and um, your voice came back. Yes. Wonderful. It's just truly wonderful. Yeah. Well, you know, this is an, this disorder is a lesson in basic in immunology and, and in the inflammatory state. And I thought that I had hoped that we would have had some, you know, immunologists, you know, the Dr. Fauci, who's a, Hen of NIAID and uh, certainly doesn't know as much as you do about this and can't think about it in, in a way that's more holistic. But but um, this is not, you have a very specific way of treatment because you have in-depth knowledge of peptides and as well as in-depth knowledge of anti-inflammatory cascades. But, but, you know, it, it doesn't take rocket science to say that certain people could benefit from vitamin C and, and, and can benefit from the simplest, simplest things, uh, like figure out how, how you like to detoxify, whether it's going into a sauna or, or something, you know, very, very basic stuff that we just don't, we're not allowed to talk about, um, except if you mm -hmm. live in Florida. I also think uh, one of the things that's been such a travesty is um, that patients who had any kind, I'm sorry, I forget where the um, study came out of, but they did the study where they said patients who had any kind of treatment, anything prior to being entering the hospital had something like a 6% chance of ending up in the ICU and patients who didn't had like a 25 or 30% chance of ending up. So any treatment right. at all. Yeah. And what we did to patients at the beginning, because we even providers and so many no. providers are so scared. We didn't even call people. We didn't even like check on them. We sent them home. And even as recently as last month, my daughter who was pregnant, her, called her primary care because she had cold symptoms. And last month, her primary care said, I'm not going to see you if you have COVID. And I was like, you have to be kidding me. What are we doing? This is what we're supposed to be doing. What did we sign up for? <laughs> well, that's right. Well, the other thing I think that I, wanna, I want you to emphasize is when you look for things in the folks with uh, the prolonged illnesses, you find, you find things that are ready confounding their immune systems and, and and activating them in non-productive ways and can you speak to that and you talked about certain testing you would do and just like with other other chronic illnesses you know you find a very high proportion of people that have mold disease and have other you know whether they have Lyme or not is 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 not I haven't seen necessarily that but mold is exceptionally common and it's it's activating the complement system and suppressing natural killer cells and then just knocking out that whole system. Yes, and we know that that's about 20% of the population and that we're seeing about 20% of the people who get COVID get long hauler. So it makes right. sense to me that we would be looking at that same population and those long haulers tend to be in their forties, which is when we tend to see not only a drop in estrogen, which certainly contributes to the inflammatory processes that are going on, but we also will see um, patients will start to develop symptoms from their mold exposure or their, their um, right. Lyme exposure or whatever the exposure was. Right. And there was of course a big, huge burden on everyone's systems. When we sent everyone and said, lockdown, go, go home close the doors, close the windows and, and just 
um, just be more and more exposed to, to mold and um, then you get sicker and sicker. Yeah, but I still find people just, I just, while, while, I, while you were giving me a lecture, I got a, a text from somebody who was in their 40s with uh, healthy, quote unquote, 40s uh, with um, pulmonary, you know, prolonged pulmonary symptoms mm -hmm. that, that was not able to be hospitalized because they felt she wasn't ill enough and go back home and get more ill. And then when you get more ill, we'll take care of you. The, the, the fascinating thing is there's no uh, convalescent plasma offered. There's no monoclonal antibody offered. There's and there's no, plenty of doses of monoclonal antibodies. There's no reason why they shouldn't be offered to every right. single person. Right, exactly. And I think it's it's a solid treatment and uh, one that's hard to find in certain cities, other, other cities is easy to find. Yep, they're giving uh, they're giving patients difficult time if they have not been vaccinated. They'll walk in the door and say, "You know, have you been vaccinated?" And then they give them a hard time about getting monoclonal antibodies. That doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, and this is a, this is still an experimental drug. It's still and and so you're asking me to sign up for a study, a research study, but you're demanding that I sign up for a research study. That's not okay. <laughs> well put. The first one is from Melvin Mario. They say, should we monitor thyroid while on GLP-1 agonist? What labs do we need to use to monitor during its use? Uh, that's a great question. So I monitor thyroid in everybody, not because they're on a GLP-1, but just because I monitor thyroid as a, as a regular course of action. And what I'm specifically looking for is their um, thyroglobulin antibody that kind of leads me down the concerning pathway. So I'm doing, um, you know, th I'm doing a thyroid exam and then I do a, a thyroid globulin antibody looking for a risk of cancer. Um, there has not been evidence of causing that in humans. It's in a rat study, but that's, remember all this data is coming straight, straight from the pharmaceutical company. So I hold that all with a grain of salt. There are some really good studies that were done, not supported by that, that Rollins one, for example, um, that were not supported by the pharmaceutical company. So I would encourage you to look that one up. I have one patient right now who was able to come off of all of his thyroid medication, and he was on pretty high dose of thyroid medication purely because of being on the GLP-1. So it has, again, what it's doing is converting that suffering thyroid into a healthier thyroid. It, it, there, are th there are GLP-1 receptors on this thyroid itself. So it's, it has that benefit. We don't need to be afraid of it. We just need to know that there is a risk of that. And so, so yes, I monitor thyroid levels, but I, it's not because they're on a GLP-1. It's just because I do it all the time anyway. What should we watch out for when using nitazoxanide? Um, so nitazoxanide has a tendency to cause diarrhea. Um, and it's an, it's a anti, I was going to say antibacterial, but it's not, it's, it's an antimicrobial. And so in those cases, I'm always going to repair their, do their repair at the same time. So as opposed to just treating with nitazoxanide, if I'm treating this patient with COVID and I'm using nitazoxanide, I'm also putting them on like, um, uh, this isn't CME. So I can say, um, like I put them on mega pre, I put them on uh, orthospore biotic. I put them on, you know, glutamine. I'm doing all kinds of things. Butyrate, you saw it, butyrate is in my list. I do a lot of butyrate with my COVID patients because I'm trying to make sure that their colon cells have the fuel they need to do the things they need to do. Um, I need to give a talk to, to y'all on the, um, if I haven't done it already, on the colon and butyrate and how that works. And it's um, super important because um, we have to make sure that their microbiome is staying in really great shape. Otherwise, these patients will um, really have that long haul. I think a lot of it has to do, especially the brain function, a lot of that post-COVID brain fog and fatigue has to do with the inflammation that occurs in the intestines from David Manginaro, dose and when to use MetBlue? So it's available oral. Um, you can use, and there are a lot of patients who do it, a lot of uh, uh, providers who will do it orally. It's available orally. Um, in some of my patients, I will use it um, IV. And I always will use the McKesson version because I know that it doesn't, that it's meth, that it's uh, mercury free. Uh, I have a hard time getting my compounders to get me a screen to tell me if it's free of mercury. And so I just don't want to introduce another problem to these patients that are already suffering. And so we'll do that usually because what we're trying to do with that is, is decrease their oxidative stress. So look up the 
um, the um, research on methylene blue IV and oxidative stress. And what you're, that's what you're trying to accomplish. So these are patients that you're treating either in the, in the cytokine storm or post COVID, trying to get their um, inflammation down there, particularly their um, cytokine storm down, increasing their oxidative capacity. And Lucia Cargill asks, when you had COVID, what treatments did you take slash do between the two fever episodes? That's a great question. So I had it and my husband also had, oh, I'm sorry, he, he was with me. We didn't know that I had it to begin with. So we were in the same bed, sleeping side by side the whole time. He never caught it. He doesn't have any antibodies as far as we know. They, far as we know. But so we both took ivermectin. We took nidazoxanide. Uh, of course, we were on vitamin D. We did, I, we did IM vitamin D. We did 200,000 international units daily for three days. Uh, we did... What else did I do? I did thymosin alpha one at two, uh, two milliliters, which is, uh, sorry, I forget what the dosing is of that two ML. I did thymosin beta four at two ML. I did, what else did we do? I mean, I did everything. We were already on, uh, both of us are, take, take, um, one of those growth hormones to create agogs regularly. We stopped his testosterone. I continued my, I was on an estrogen patch at the time. What else? And, you know, both of us exercise regularly. We do a lot of resistance training. So, you know, when we eat right, there was, we were doing intermittent fasting during that time. So I think that was part of the reason why we had that really short course of their, of, of illness as, was intermittent fasting during that time. But again, he never tested positive. And to this day, you know, repeated antibody testing still never tested positive. And we have another question from Melvin, and it says, can we prescribe Zodaxin and will it be covered by insurance? Oh, I wish it was. Um, it's actually been recently really, the FDA has really come down on it in the last uh, just few months. Most of the compounding pharmacies don't even make it anymore. So it's very difficult to get. Um, there are a few uh, companies that were there's a, a, a group called Global Physician Alliance that's working on ways for us to get it legally where we can get it from a foreign physician. So they will actually technically prescribe it and bring a test. Anyway, I don't know all the details. I'm not an expert in the business end of it, uh, but there are groups working on how do we get uh, thymus and alpha available for us to use again. But right now, unfortunately, it got caught up in this uh, whole FDA cytokine storm of uh, really taking away a lot of our good medications. I had several dementia patients that were doing awesome on cerebrolysin, and that was really a travesty to watch that end. Isn't meth blue also antibacterial as I use in Lyme, et cetera? Yes, but its primary mechanism of action is in the um, antioxidants, is as an antioxidant or in upregulating your own antioxidants, your NRF2 production so that you're doing your own catalase and hemoxidase one. When you use VIP, do you use it immediately or do you do the shoemaker protocol steps first? So it depends on the patient very much depends on the patient. Um, if they are, um, I'm gonna use this if, so I, right now I have an 85 year old who's coming back to me from the hospital. He ended up with, he saw me for the first time on day five. So we were already really past being able to help a lot um, outpatient. And so, um, and they weren't really able to afford biologics and la la, whatever. Anyway, he ended up in the hospital. And so, uh, sorry, I forgot the question. <laughs> oh, he's coming back to me, I think tomorrow. And so we'll start him on VIP, super low dose, that five microgram, really low dose, probably start him with once a day. I'll bump it up every day. As long as he tolerates it, we'll bump it up every single day till the max dose, um, which is uh, 500 four times a day, really just because I'm trying to restart, reset his circadian rhythm. I'm trying to upregulate his NAD production. Every cell in his body right now is depleted of NAD, especially in an 85 year old who's already depleted of NAD. Your CERT1 needs NAD. Your uh, PARP, which is your um, DNA repair uh, protein needs NAD. Everything needs NAD. So he's, his immune system, all of his immune cells need NAD. We got to get him tanked back up. So I'll start him with, um, with that as soon as possible. Where do you get your peptides? That depends. Um, some of them I get from, um, some from South Lake, uh, which is in Florida. Um, there's a pharmacy in California called Peptide Pharmacy that I get some of them from that, you know, there's this Create Pharmacy does a few, uh, Pharmaceo in Texas does a few, who else does them? Um, Wells does a few, 
I um, yeah. Not too many anymore. Yep. Why hold testosterone? So there's some evidence that patients who have a higher testosterone do do worse when they get uh, when they do. It's probably related to the reason why. It's probably related to how you know men don't tend to get inflammatory diseases. They don't tend to get that sort of autoimmune kind of process as much. They because they're controlled by their by their testosterone. If they have that higher testosterone, they have a harder time killing producing natural killer cells and killing off those those. So what we are there if they're on testosterone at the very beginning. Now we're talking about a longer viral. Uh, period. Um, it doesn't have much to do with the cytokine storm phase. It has more to do with the viral replication phase. Can we do Regeneron for prophylaxis? So it's interesting that you asked that. I just listened this morning to the Joe Rogan with uh, Peter McCullough, and I'm pretty sure I heard him say that he does it daily. <laughs> Maybe I misunderstood that, but that's pretty interesting. You're not supposed to. It's supposed to be um, only for positive tested patients, but there's there's enough doses in the United States for everyone to get dosed. Jan McCormick asks, how do you control factor B factor on a regular basis without putting patient on heparin, et cetera? Other alternatives? Natokinase versus lumbrokinase? Oh, got it. Yes. So those are definitely awesome things. And I use both of those in patients who um, I can't put on pentosan polysulfate. Definitely. That's who I'll use it in. Yeah. So if they have a macular problem or if they're already on some other um, anticoagulant, or if there's another reason why I shouldn't, I don't want to use uh, pentosan polysulfate, I'll put them on one of those for sure. Yep. Yeah. And one of the, some of the target labs you want to target is to Put the ferritin level back to normal. Put the D-dimer level back to normal. CRP. C CRP is often, sometimes elevated, but often not. And um, make sure the homocysteine levels are are optimized to get their appropriate B vitamins and get some magnesium. I mean, it's a holistic approach. You know, it's whatever goes into the appropriate uh, cycle that ends up to work with NAD to produce more ATP. So mm -hmm. you know, you can't be starving can't be eating hospital food and get better. Uh, so you can't get enough amino acids. Uh, you can't get enough fatty acids, that's for sure. So it's gonna be a, a whole strategy, but that strategy is is anti-aging strategy and it's the appropriate strategy for all of us to have. So this was a lesson in, in identifying and, and showing people that this is the way you not only treat, but this is the way you prevent it in the first place. And, but once you get, once you, once you get ill and you can reverse it in 48 hours with a whole bunch of things, perhaps, and more, more tools that Dr. To Turner had than the average person has, but the fact that that is possible, it shows you how potent you can, you, you know, how many things we have in the toolbox that may, you know, that they're, they're come at it from different perspectives, but they're all multi-layered and we can't handle you know, a lot of these folks are falling off a cliff, okay? So they're falling off a cliff. You can't say, I'm just going to treat you with- Tylenol. With Tylenol. I mean, that's ludicrous. But keep All in right, mind, right. whatever you do, keep in mind that that study that said that patients who had any treatment ahead of time, even if all you're doing is helping them with mindfulness so that they are less calm when they go in, then you're removing, I mean, less anxious when they go in, you're removing one of their risk factors, which is anxiety. So- Anything that you do ahead of time is going to improve their outcome. Well, oh, beautiful. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Turner for her extraordinary um, ability to explain complicated physiology. And thank you again so much. And thank you everyone in the audience, uh, ACAM members, APM, APMD members, friends, family, patients, clients, everyone. Thank you so much and have a great, great, great holiday. And we'll see you again sometime after the new year. Thank you, Avi. Bye-bye.